come to worship God in this house. Amen. So I'm thankful for a bunch of young people in the house. They're full of life. Amen. I'm just going to be honest with you. Amen. I've, I've been to churches before where you've got some folks that, man, I mean, I mean, we've got some folks around here who still worship with you in 95. I can remember my Aunt Elizabeth, amen, and she was in her 80s. Amen. And she had a, just got a concrete hip. That's guess what they called it. I guess, I guess they put sacrete in there. I don't know what they did. Tupperware, I don't know what they put in there, but I know she had just got a hip replacement. I'll never forget this as long as I live. She sat back there and she decided she was going to run with the little ones. Amen. She got up and she said, you know what? I'm not going to let some young kid out worship me. She said, well, that's just crazy. We don't do that around. What's wrong with you, Brother D? Is that biblical? Yes, it is. It's in the book, folks, as long as it's done in decency and in order. That's the question. Amen. That means we don't run around here blind running into folks. Amen. Having crashes. Amen. Matter of fact, the Bible says, and Amen, I believe it was the book of Deuteronomy or it was the book of Numbers. When God changed the diet at a place called Kirjath uh, Hatava, if I say that wrong, bear with me, I'm sorry. Amen. I'm trying to speak in tongues up here without even trying. Amen. But Kirjath Hatava, Amen, was a city where God literally turned around the Israelites from the direction they were going and made them face an opposite direction. Turned them around. Changed the flavor of the manna that they had to an oily flavor. And the Bible said that the Spirit of the Lord fell there. And when it fell there, it fell upon, first of all, the elders. Amen. And the elders, amen, they... Uh, some folks said, that, well, why should they have, they, the Bible said they started prophesying. That's what old folks do. Amen. They prophesy. Amen. He, hey, amen. They, they don't have young legs anymore. And then the Eldab, and it fell upon Eldab and Medab, it says. And these were folks that represented middle age folks. And if you want to study out the words, you can. Uh, and the Bible said it fell upon them and they began to prophesy because they needed some new needs. Amen. But it said when it fell upon the young men, when that spirit fell upon the young men, it says the young men ran. Amen. Why? Because when the Holy Ghost moves upon you, when God's presence moves upon you, even if it's not indwelling in you, amen, it forces something in you. This natural does not know what to do when the supernatural begins to move upon it. That's why some folks will start crying. They don't even know why they're crying. They just start crying. I don't know why I'm crying. I don't know why I'm crying. It's because it's the Holy Ghost. Amen. God's divine power and His divine presence is moving upon you. It may not be dwelling in you yet. Amen. But you know what? I can tell when I jump in the water, I get wet. I don't have to have anybody tell me I'm wet. Amen. That doesn't mean I'm drinking the water. It doesn't mean the water's around me. Amen. You know, that's why I try to tell folks. I, I know some folks, they, they, they go to church and all of a sudden they, they think they got the Holy Ghost because they got a couple of shivers. Amen. No, no. Bible's very clear. Amen. Peter said it like this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is unto you and to your children, to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You know, it amazes me, and I'll, I'll, I guess it always blows my mind when I think about it today. You know, because some folks, they might look at and I always wanted Donald Trump to do this, President Trump. I always wanted him to do this. I, none of these other presidents will do it, so I'd like to see him do it. He's just kind of crazy anyway, so you never know what that guy's going to do. But I'd like to see him step out on the White House lawn and begin to worship God with his whole heart. Well, people don't do that. David, the sweet psalmist, the king of Israel did. With all of his heart, David stepped out on the White House lawn. Amen, if I can say it as such. And the Bible said he danced before the Lord with all of his might. There's a time and a place for it, folks. Amen. Praise God. It's not all the time, but there was a time and a place for it. Praise God. Sometimes he comes, amen, in such a way where his presence begins to move into a place. You just lift your hands before the Lord. The Bible says what? Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Amen. I'd be worried about going to a church where I constantly got to sit there and just kind of nod my head a couple times. Let them tell me when it's okay to say amen. Let your yea be yea and let your nay be nay. Amen. 
I'm thankful this morning for the opportunity to be in the house of God. He has given me the breath of life for another day, and I shall embrace it. I shall embrace it. You know, I, I was just at the cancer doc about uh, uh, the other day. I had to go for a yearly exam there. And uh, it's been seven years now, I guess, since the, you know, the great bald spot, as I like to call it. Amen. Uh, it's not Saturn there, folks. Amen. That's just my hair. And uh, uh, where they had to radiate my head and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I walked in there and she said, let me tell you something. She goes, I want you to know this. She says, I'm not even going to do another blood test on you. I said, well, why not? I mean, that's what I'm here for, right? She goes, no, I'm not going to do another blood test on you. Let me tell you why. Because you're already seven or eight years removed from this thing. If it was going to come back, it would already come back by now. She said, we don't have to try to look for it. She said, if it does come back, it will come back in that same spot. Amen. And I said, Are you? she goes, we know, the, we know how this works. Amen. She goes, we do this all the time. So I'm telling you, you don't have to come back to me for blood tests no more. That's what she said. Amen. You know, it's funny because whenever yeah, folks do not know the situation surrounding when I was first received that uh, diagnosis, uh, we had just adopted our daughter, Kylie. She wasn't but a little bitty thing, two, two and a half years old. And I thought, oh me, oh my, what a time. And, um, but you know, someone said it, and I'll never forget it. They sat there in this chair right here, and I was just just being honest with I'm just going to be, can I be transparent with you all for a little bit? I was fretting. I was. I'm not going to sit there and tell you I wasn't. Cause, and I'm going to be honest about this. I wasn't so much worried about me, and I know you may not believe that, but I really wasn't. I was scared for me, but I was more worried for my family members. How would they get by without me? What would Michelle do? What would Kylie do? What would... Jacob do? What, what are they going to do without me? Amen. And Michelle, pretty lady, she'd probably marry again, probably marry a better man than me. Amen. But I'm going to be honest with you. At the time, I, that's not what I was thinking. I said, oh, God, it's in your hands. How many of y'all know there's times we get in these little spots in life where it's just in God's hands? and you, It's out of your hands, and you go... There comes a time in every man's and every woman's life you just have to trust God for some things in your life. Because, you know, we're all control freaks. You know that, don't you? Whether we like to admit it or not. When you all drive, you and your husband drive, you and your husband and wife drive, you all argue over who's going to get to drive. I'm, no, I'm driving. No, you're driving. No, I'm driving. Right? Why is that? Because I want to control the wheel. That's why. I remember down jail ministry one night I was looking at, I'll get to my message in a minute, bear with me, I told you, I'm just, I was looking at a young man one time, he says, I don't believe in rules. I said, do you drive? He said, yeah, I drive. I said, do you ever stop at a red light? He said, well, of course I have. I said, you believe in rules. Folks always like to put up this big old, like they're all that in a bag of chips. Come on now. Can we just be real with one another? Amen. I want to get to here today. I want you to know that He is worthy to be worshipped. If you woke up this morning, you ought to magnify God. I don't care what's come your way today. You hear me? I, it doesn't matter what's come your way today. You ought to magnify God if He gave, if He gave you an opportunity to praise Him. Uh, if He gave you an opportunity to magnify Him. Uh, if He gave you an opportunity to lift your voice to Him again today. Come on, there's going to be folks lifting their voice, cussing all over Facebook today. Amen. But I'm going to lift my voice today, and I'm going to be one that says, I'm so thankful for what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me in a place called Calvary. I'm so thankful that He died on a cross for me, that He shed His blood. Amen. And through Him I have remission of sins. I'm so glad that He was buried in a tomb, but I'm extremely excited that He rose again on the third day. Can I tell you one more time here today? Amen. And don't ever forget this. And don't ever let it become sour in your heart today. Remember this always. Jesus Christ loves you with all of His heart. Folks, I want you to understand something. You are loved today. If you have your Bibles with me, please turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 17, verse 15. 
in the Song of Solomon 2 and 4. We'll just put these verses up very quickly. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi or Adonai Nisi or Yahweh Nisi. Big long Hebrew Aramaic word. Simply means the Lord is my banner. Amen. When kings would go to fight, they would bring a banner with them, amen, to declare even who they were. Some would put lions on it. Some would put tigers and bears, oh my. But they put it there. Even today we have football teams with emblems of helmets and baseball teams with emblems on their helmets trying to declare who they are. Amen. Song of Solomon 2 and 4. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. God's designed banner over you is that he flat out loves you. Also, the book of Samuel, chapter 17, verse 12 through 14, be my final verses today. Amen. Now David was the son of that Ithathite of Bethlehem, Judah whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse were and followed Saul to the, went and followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, who was the firstborn, and the next unto him, the secondborn, Abinadab, and the third was Shammah. Amen. The third was Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. Can we just put our Bibles down for just a few minutes, please? I want to preach to you for just a little while on the flag bearer today. Even the flag bearer. Can we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we of ourselves are nothing. But by your divine hand we are led today. In you we move and we have our being here today. Lord, your divine purpose is in our hearts here today. Help us, O God, for another day today. Lord, we need you because of ourselves we are nothing. And Lord, we just pray today, Lord God, that you'll touch every life, every heart, every soul in this place today. That the power of the blood of Jesus Christ will touch each and every one of us here today to bring about a helpful change in our hearts and our lives this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing and reverencing the word of the Lord here today. I uh, certainly are thankful for our visitors here today. Let me extend... Amen. Uh, a thank you from me personally to you. Amen. Uh, we are not a full staff, but that's okay. Amen. Two or more is all we need, the Bible says. And we've got two or more, so that's all we need around here. Amen. And I'm thankful for each and every one of you that came out today. appreciate you waking up and not taking that extra hour of sleep. Amen. And just running with it. Amen. Uh, but, you know, the Bible makes it very clear. Amen. That his banner over us, he said, was going to be love. It was going to be the one agent that God used for every direction he takes in your life is because he loves you, whether you know it or not. Even when things don't seem like they make any sense to us or are going our way, God still loves us. Amen. I have looked at my parents in my lifetime growing up, and they have done some things I have not been real happy with them about. And you as parents growing up with your children, you have done things that they have looked at you and says, well, I don't understand why you won't let me have this or why I can't do this or why I can't do that. And there are times in our walk with God, He does the exact same things to us. when We don't understand what's going on because, let's face it, we're a bunch of know-it-alls. We think we know everything. Amen? Did I just hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. We're adults here. Let's can just act like adults for a while. Nobody likes to be wrong. Admit it. I don't like to be wrong. Amen. I thought my wife made a good choice when she married me. She still struggles with that decision today. Amen. And I know I made a good choice when I married her. Amen. And she still agrees with me. But the Bible makes it clear that he brings about three people he talks about in this great battle. First Samuel chapter 17. Everybody knows the story. It's the battle of David and Goliath. This is the battle in the valley of Elah where Saul 
who was the tallest among all Israelites, head and shoulders above them all, the Bible says. By physical stature to look at him, he was the man of the hour. We would pick him any minute in a football game. We'd look at Saul and we'd say, he's the guy. Bring him over here. I want him on my team when we're picking teams because he was big. Amen. And he had the size to seemingly do anything he wanted to do. Amen. And Saul, the Bible makes it clear, (coughs) he was not always a troubled Saul. There was a time when Saul had great victory, the Bible makes it clear. Times where he destroyed the Philistines on a couple of occasions, where Israel uh, actually had great rejoicing under his reign. A good time of good feelings. A time of plenty. Amen. A time of structure. A time of rejoicing for them. Because everybody, when they think of Saul, do not think of that. They always think of Saul's end and not his beginning. Saul's beginning was he was with God in the beginning. You see, when you're with God, things tend to go your way when you're with God. Even though you may battle, even though you may have go through things that you don't understand why you're dealing with, that doesn't mean they won't go your way. Amen. Because there's three things God always puts in your path to secure your victory. And we see them, <coughs> excuse me, in Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah. You know, it's always very important that when the Bible puts certain names into the Scripture, it's important for us to read them, to look up their name, to see what they mean because they're there for a reason. He puts those three names there for us. <clears throat> for our understanding for a reason. There may be a reason in simple fact that he could have simply put the three sons of Saul, the eldest three sons of Saul he could have put in there and not ever put their names. But you know, unique is Scripture in those ways. Sometimes Scripture will just pair things out in a way to say, I want you to stop and look at this. And so I stopped and I looked at that. It's amazing how that works. And I began to not just go to the battle of David and Goliath, but to look at these three sons of Saul. To look at those, amen, and realize that before the battle was ever given, before Goliath was ever going to declare to Israel that he was going to feed their flesh to the fowls of the air and to curse their gods, and as he would stand out there for 40 days while they cowered, God always had men by Saul's side that he never knew what he had in them. Excuse me for just a second. He said, I have given you before you ever go to battle. And you all need to understand this. God has given you three things before you ever go to battle that's already with you and you don't even know it sometimes. They're right in the midst of the ranks with you. They're standing with you, not against you. Amen. The first is Eliab. His name simply means, my father is God, or a godly father. It speaks of a headship and authority of God in your life. Please understand something, that you go forth with the authority of God into every battle that you ever face, no matter what Goliath or what brother of Goliath it may be. No matter what giant stands against you, always remember you're going under the auspices of God. Not because of who you are, but because He dwelleth in you. If you've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, amen, Christ dwells within you. Amen. And He is the headship and the authority over all things. Amen. And you have that already with you. You have God's authority in your life. Now you may say, well, what if I have authority? How come the enemy can still reign and rule sometimes? It seems like the things that's going on around me if I have headship and authority. I'll tell you very much. How many of y'all know we have police officers here today? Does everybody always stop when they say stop or I'll shoot? Do they do that? 
Not everybody stops, right? Not everybody listens to them. When they put the red lights on, the blue lights on behind them, woo, woo. Do you always pull over? I do. I've had many a speeding ticket. I know. There's the authority of a 55 mile an hour sign. Doesn't mean I always do it. Should I do it? Do I do it? Thank you for your honesty. I couldn't even speak it. I'm so horrendous. Just because you got headship and authority does not mean the devil will always listen to it. Sometimes he will circumvent headship and authority, but you have it. And because you have it, you have the power to use something with it. You see, me and you just can't go around doing stuff the policemen can do. Me and you aren't allowed just to go ahead and and start making drug busts. Me and you ain't allowed to go around and just go arrest our neighbor when he does something mean to us. Me and you just can't, we just can't, we don't have the, we don't have a badge behind us. We don't have any of that stuff behind us to do that kind of stuff. But let me tell you, they do. Amen. And let me explain to you something. You have authority in Jesus Christ. Understand this. You have the authority of God in your life. Amen. To declare unto the enemy of your soul that he needs to get out of your life. Amen. You have the authority under the Word of God that you can rebuke the devourer. Amen. You need to understand something here today. You do have authority in God. Some folks don't even have the authority. The seven sons of seven found that out. Amen. They found out that they didn't even have the headship and the authority to try to cast out devils. And they leaped upon them and destroyed them. You know, folks, I'm telling you, we need to understand something here that you have authority in Jesus Christ. And you're covered under the blood of the Lamb. And because you're covered under the blood of the Lamb, please understand this, you have the authority of God. Saul had that with him and did not even realize it. He had his son Abinadab with him, which simply means the father of a vow or a promise. We have the promises of God that are with us. God is not a liar. God is not cruel. God is for you. He is not against you. He is with us not against us. He is in us, not away from us. And because of that, amen, not only do you have His headship and authority, but you have the promises of God. You have the promises of God every time you open up this book and you begin to read the Word of God and you begin to read out the promises of God. Blessed shalt thou be, He said, when thou goest in. Blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Blessed shall be thy basket. Blessed shall be thy store. He speaks of these things, but yet we never pray them. When you pray the promises of God with the authority of God. Hear me, folks. Amen. It doesn't always mean you're here to defeat a battle just yet. But it means it's always with you. You don't always face Goliath every day. You don't always face problems that come at you in such a giant form. Some days we have these little problems. Amen. Little issues that irritate our world. But we've already got the promises and the authority of God to take care of those situations. And we need to speak those promises. We need to read those promises. We need to pray those promises of God that they'll come to pass in our life. Why do you think the enemy always fights you on prayer more than anything else in this world? He's petrified of your prayer life. He's petrified when you crack open that book and you begin to read the promises of God. He is petrified when you begin to take authority in the name of Jesus Christ in your life. When's the last time you walked around your house and began to praise and worship in your rooms? When's the last time you walked around your house and took some olive oil and put them over the doorways and began to speak faith in your own household? When's the last time you walked around your yard, amen, and began to speak faith and trusting God, amen, around your household? When's the last time? You took authority in your own life. Sometimes we just sit there and take it. And take it. And finally we have Shammah. Or Shammah. 
It simply means God is here. Don't ever forget, Jesus said it best, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. You know, the enemy likes to get you alone and try to make you feel like nobody cares about you or that nobody cares about your situation. He likes to get you in some little place where he wants you to think that nobody just cares at all and that you ought to just give up and you ought to quit. And what's the point? Nobody ever wants to help me when I'm in trouble. Did you ever stop to think the reason nobody's helping you is because he's fighting you when you're in trouble? Did you ever stop to think that? Can I tell you, you know why churches have revival on one side of town? Because there's a church praying on the other side of town and they're fighting them. Amen. You see, the devil's only got one third. We got two thirds. The Bible makes that very clear. You got a church praying on this side of town. They seem like they're fighting every, everything under the sun while the other church is having revival. Thank God they're having revival. Let them continue to have revival because pretty soon they're going to start praying over there while they're having revival. And when they start praying while they're having revival over there, amen, it's going to start freeing up some things on your side of town. Amen. Come on, how many of y'all know that Daniel prayed and immediately he had to deal with a demonic presence, amen? The prince of Persia came along, he had to fight him for 21 days. Come on, folks, I'm telling you, when you start praying, you're going to start battling. When you start doing things, but if you'll continue to do it, amen, you're going to start seeing victory like you've never seen before. Because the one thing that you've got that the devil does not got, amen, is you're consistent. That's why he tries to get you to miss on Sunday morning. Try to give you every excuse under the sun why you need not be there. And the more you miss, the easier it is to miss. You do it one Sunday, you'll do it three. And the next thing you know, you're out of church and you wonder how you got there. Because I want you to understand the enemy's desire is for you not to get under the Word of God, to get under the authority of God, or get into the presence of God. Because he knows if you can get under his authority, if you can get into his presence, if you can get into the promises of God, that you're going to garner strength, that you're going to garner power, and God's going to help you. He's going to see you through your situation. He's going to see you through your problem. And sooner or later, whether it's a short trial, it's a small Goliath, or it's a big Goliath, it doesn't matter. God will will see you through to the end of this thing because He loves you. You see, the devil had all those things when he faced Israel. He had Goliath. He was the embodiment of the devil's headship and authority. He was the embodiment of the promise that he was going to defeat Israel. We need not fight with all these armies. Just send me a man. You know what I love about that whole scenario? There's a lot of things to be said about David and Goliath in that story. and He could be here all day. But you know what I really like? Is God never gave in to one of the devil's demands. Not one. Send me a man. So he sent him a boy. Send me a warrior. So he sent him a shepherd. Send You send me somebody that's... Got a sword in their hand and God sent him a slingshot. Woo! I'll tell you, there are times in our life, folks, that we just accept it and take it what he demands of us. We do not have to give in to his demands. You have headship and authority. You have power through the Lord Jesus Christ. You have his promises that are with you. And His presence that is with you, even when you don't understand what's going on. I'm not going to lie to you. These men, they had the promises of God. They had the presence of God. Listen to me now. And they had His authority. And yet they were still cowering in fear. Still sitting back, hiding behind rocks. And we can laugh all we want to, but we face a glass, we've done the same thing. Come on. You've got God's presence. You've got God's authority. You, come on. You've got His promises. And yet you're still nervous. 
Yet you're still anxious. <laughs> but God knows that. Now I know it's easy for us, and, I, and I've heard, <laughs> I can't tell you how many people I've heard say this. That's not having faith. Well, it's called having humanity. It may not be faith, but I call it humanity. This flesh still, <laughs> as much as I like to say it's subdued, it's not always subdued like I want it to be. You don't have any faith if you do that. I'm going to be honest with you, folks. Amen. Sometimes Goliath's pretty big. But sometimes you just feel like hiding. All of a sudden you find yourself wanting to go to bed at 6 o'clock in the evening. Just so you don't have to face the rest of the day. Am I speaking to anybody? All of a sudden you just feel like you're so stressed out and you can't be blessed. Come on. And so we run to the pharmacist. Listen, I'm not here to pick on. Don't, don't, I'm not here to, I'm, don't, I'm not here poking. You understand me? Please don't think I am. I'm not. There's times we just get so frustrated waiting on God. Do you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Remember, I told you I'm here. I told you I'll never leave you. I told you I'll never forsake you. You promise? It's already in the Word. I can't lie. I need some authority here because there's authorities that's greater than me. He said, I've overcome the world. (laughs) The reason they hate you is because they hated me first. You're on the right track. Hang in there. Hang in there. You're on the right track. You hang in there because I'm going to send something to you. I got a little shepherd on the back side of a wood. He's been working with a slingshot. He's pretty good with it. You don't like this guy. He's a... To look at him, he's not very impressive. I mean, after all, he's, he's ruddy. He's a little fella. But man, he's incredible with that slingshot. You ought to watch him go. He sets up cans all day long while he's watching sheep, and he takes this little thing and starts dinging them all day long. Man, he can do it behind his back. Watch him. So you didn't know this, but he's been slaying lions and bears in places you've never even seen before. You didn't know this, but he's been doing stuff on the backside of the desert that you had no clue about. You see, God's always working in the background of your life, and you don't even know it. He's working out stuff for you. You had no idea what he was doing. When you didn't understand what was... My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right. When you didn't have a clue what was going on, God was already in the mix, working things out in places you never even thought about. He was already putting things back together in ways for you you never thought possible. He was already preparing a deliverance for you, even on the backside of a desert somewhere, in a place that's so far from your mind that you didn't even know it was coming. Until one day, Jesse says, okay, David. (laughs) He wasn't going down there to fight a Goliath. Go give your brother some cheese. Go send some bread down there. Just go feed him, would you? He goes down to where his brothers are and he hears, of course, about the battle with Goliath. And David didn't even take but two seconds. He was already on this thing. No sooner he heard Goliath out there, he seen his brothers out there all cowering away. And he done whooped the lion. He done whooped the bear. He knew where he was at. Amen. And he, he knew he was confident in his God. He was confident in his abilities of his God. <laughs> and the Bible says that, you know, the most amazing thing to me is, is not just the courage of David. Amen. It was the confidence of David. David steps out on the scene of this, of, this, of this incredible battle with his older brothers and, he, and they're cowering and he sees Saul who he looked up to at six foot six or whatever he may have been. Sees him cowering also and sees Goliath out there cursing him by his gods, he said. And David said, oh no, you can do a lot of things. You can say a lot of things about this and that, but you can't talk about my God like that. Amen. And David, the Bible says, immediately ran to the back. He talked to Saul and tried to put on his armor. He couldn't wear Saul's armor. He wasn't ready for it. Amen. Praise God. He couldn't prove it. And the Bible said he went down to meet Goliath and he ran toward the battle. 
He ran toward Goliath. He ran at him. You know, everybody that's ever owned a ship will tell you, when there's a storm coming, you don't run away from the storm. You turn into the storm. Or your ship will be overturned. David said, I'm going to fight this thing tooth and nail. I'm going to fight because God is with me. And when David went to the battle, amen, can I tell you what it really was? It was the Lord bringing deliverance for those that had been stressed out, for those that had been fearful, for those because He cares for you. Get this in your heads. He cares for you. He cares what you're going through. He cares about what situations are happening in your financial life. He cares what situations are happening in your personal life. He cares what's going on in your world if you're dealing with authorities. He cares. And He knows sometimes some things are greater than you. You know, sometimes we sit and we cower in corners going, God, where are you? And He said, I'll tell you what my banner is. He said, my banner's not in my headship. My banner's not in the authority. My banner's not even in my promises. My banner's not even, (laughs) come on, my banner is not even. (laughs) He said, my banner is love. And here comes David. Oh, by the way, his name means beloved. Here comes his love. (laughs) Let me send my love to you. My love brings forth action because I love you. I'm going to take care of this. Because I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm telling, I'm telling you I'm going to walk into the scene of your situation and I'm going to take care of it for you. Amen. I'm going to, while you're cowering in corners, I'm going to be working this out. While you're cowering in corners, amen, I'm going to send forth the love of God and the love of God is going to come flying into that thing. Let me tell you what they used to do before they go into a battle. They get upon a horse and a flat would take his flag and he put it up in the air and he waved it back and forth before the battle would start. Amen. And he'd run back and forth with the flag. I can see little David right now saying, it's better over me. It's love. Come on, Goliath. Come on, Goliath. Come on, Goliath. Because his banner over you is love. At the end of the day, the reason God will always deliver His anointed is because He loves us. God's simple driving force is love. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. (laughs) For God so loved the world. And He sent His only begotten Son, and who should believeth on Him should not perish. Notice it doesn't say shall, not it says should not. There's a difference between should and shall. Please don't use that as your salvation scripture. It ain't one. <laughs> but have everlasting life. <laughs> God commended His love towards us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says that when David defeated Goliath, he took his head and he buried it at Jerusalem. He took the head of Goliath and he buried it at Jerusalem. His name was Goliath of Gath. I find it interesting the place Jesus went to. The place where he died on a cross. It was a place called Golgath. It's a place where many Jews believe that the head of Goliath is buried. It's on Golgotha, the place of the skull. It wasn't called the place of the skull because of its shape, but because Goliath's head was there. When Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, He wasn't just telling, <laughs> telling Christians it's going to be okay. He was telling anybody and everybody that his bad anyone that would come toward him is love and that he would deliver whomsoever would. 
Because you know the amazing thing about this, it's not for whomsoever won't, it's for whomsoever will. If you will, he will. That's why the Bible makes it clear. On the day of Pentecost, in an upper room, about 120 were gathered there, the day of the wheat harvest. The Bible said there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each and every one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to speak with other tongues. The Spirit of God gave the utterance. They began to fall out of that upper room, out into the streets of the city. People looked at them and says, and are drunk. Some folks says, what is this? And Peter spoke up. He said, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he began to talk about Jesus Christ. He's the same Jesus whom you have crucified. You have slain on a tree. God hath both highly exalted him. Amen. And made him Lord of all. And he began to tell them that they killed this one. Amen. That they were looking for the Messiah that they were looking for. This is the question for the ages, not just for the Jews. It was for the ages. When they realized what they had done, realized that this was the Messiah, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter spoke up. Remember, Jesus told Peter, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. I don't care who thinks people who's got the keys. I know who's got them. Peter had the keys to the kingdom. Jesus said so. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom, Peter. And Peter began to speak. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent, he said, and be baptized, every one of you. It's not an exclusive word. He didn't say every Jew. He said every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is unto you and to your children, to those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God should call. Because when you do that, you get his headship, you get his authority, you get his love, you get his promises. You hear me? You get all of those things wrapped up in him. And you get his ever divine presence living on the inside of you. I got a question for you today. Don't ever forget about the love of God. Who's forgotten that God loves you? Nobody's afraid to admit it. There's times you feel that way. Have you ever looked into the heavens and said, God, why do you hate me? Have you ever said it? So your flesh has never come out, huh? You've never hidden behind rocks before. You're just ashamed to admit it in front of everybody, huh? Okay, I've done it. I said, God, do you hate me? Why me? He said, no, I don't hate you. You I love. I'm here to tell you a very simple message today. I know I've said a lot. Let me make it very simple and very clear. Jesus loves you. It's just that simple. The Lord is your banner. I'd like you all to stand with me if you would. I feel God's divine presence in this place today. Some of you have been dealing with stuff. Let's tell Michelle this I came here today. I said, I had absolutely nothing to preach this morning. Nothing. Sometimes God just blanks me. I mean, he does it every now and then. I'm like, Lord, I can't just go back in the old shoebox and find something. I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't preach moldy bread. I said, you like this stuff baked fresh. And I was sitting down this morning. The situations that's been going on for me and my family and things we've been struggling with, dealing with and other people I began to think of here in this church that they've been dealing with and struggling with. I said, Lord, I said, I know you're almighty. 
And I know you care. I know you care. God, but sometimes we just need a little victory. Sometimes we just need a little victory. And he brought me to David and Goliath again. I have to read about these three boys. See, I know some of your all's issues, things you've been dealing with. We all have them. We do. But I know a God that says a simple fact. You hear this, and I need you to hear it. God is not cruel. Jesus loves you. I want to open these altars right now. There any that would like to come and pray? There any that would like to seek God's face? Lord, any of them like God to help you here today. To remind you just again one more time how much He cares for you. How much He loves you. These altars are open. Please come. Please pray.